my name is Jamie Tomey from Artist Bookhouse. I am pleased to welcome you to this Artist Bookhouse conversation with Don Widmer, a papermaker and paper artist. Hope you enjoy. Hi, Don. Welcome. How are you today? I'm great. Doing well. So usually the first question that we ask, how did you come to the book arts? So how did you come to arts? Well, I was a music librarian and my coworker, um, another music librarian, suggested to me one day that I look into taking some workshops at the Center for Book and Paper, um, mm -hmm. which I had not heard of. And so I, I started to explore it and um, signed up for, I believe, a letterpress uh, class. And from there, I just got hooked. I mean, I took maybe three or four workshops. Um, and then I uh, eventually quit my job so that I can prepare a portfolio because, you know, I, I didn't have an art background. Um, so I took several months to put a portfolio together based on the workshops I was taking at the center and yeah. then applied for the uh, MFA. Nice, nice. And when did you start the MFA program? 2009. And so you were one of the last groups that went through. Um, and so what happened post-graduation? What did your life look like at that point? Were you a studio artist? Do you have a job right now besides being an artist? What did that look like post-grad? Sure. So I, even before I graduated, I started um, selling some of my art, uh, in particular, my letterpress cards and um, some prints and um, some books. And so I had a company called Line of Bali. Mm. Um, and I was selling... You know, I was one of the first, I think, um, people to start sh selling with Shop Columbia when that started, and um, am still in have still have some pieces in that shop, and so from there I started doing some craft shows, and that evolved into more of the fine art fairs that happen around the country. Right, um, nice the travel I've, I've ones. Stuck, yes, I'm yeah. stuck in the Midwest, but. Um, so up until this past year, I was doing probably 20 or more shows a year, which keeps you busy. Keeps you busy and takes a lot of energy, I would think. It does. It does. So that's so primarily uh, my, my source of income and my, um, what my output was aimed towards, uh, what I knew could sell and connect with an audience at those shows. Yeah, nice. So did you, did you like, when you were at home and or in your studio, you were producing inventory sort of, I'm putting that in quotes, but yes. it's kind of what it is. Um, did you have like a thought towards more, so they were more fine arts or they were more craft arts? Because with paper and book, you could go both ways. So how do you delineate between the two and which did you put in those booths? Yeah, and did it depend on the show, the place? It really You're not, depends. It's like all the things. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, that's the great thing about it. And a lot of it, what I found over the years of doing this, so now I've been doing the shows for maybe nine years, something like that. Um, what I found is it really opened up conversations that you had with uh, customers which is really the fantastic part about doing these shows. And a lot of talk about what is the difference between um, craft and art, if there is in this, um, in the book arts, particularly with paper making that cross sort of crosses over. I mean, it comes out of the craft tradition. Um, yeah. So I do mostly pulp painting and I consider them uh, fine art pieces. But, you know, they still have, so it's a lot of talking with people about the creation of the sheet of paper itself and that right. the, the paper itself is part of the, uh, the piece of art as opposed to 
the image that I put onto the sheet with the, with the pulp. And so uh, looking closely at the texture of the, of the sheet, the fibers, the inclusions that are in it, and talking to people about that. I mean, people are so fascinated with, with the pulp painting because so many of them have never heard of it before. Right. And I imagine the idea of adding those inclusions and the, the bits and little, the ways that the paper are made um, fascinates people who don't know, like the paper as a substrate adds to the depth of the piece. So if you're doing your bird series, you're adding things in the inclusions that have to do with what birds eat or what, am I just making an assumption here? No, or what birds no that's exactly what it is. Yeah. yeah, so I feel like people who don't necessarily know how our brains as book and paper artists work, where we're adding that extra layer that they might not know is in there, but we know it's in there, and it adds to the depth of the work. So to have those conversations is probably pretty amazing. Did you miss that last year? Was that like something that broke your heart because of COVID? I'm just putting those words into your mouth, Don. <laughs> but just thinking no. about if you can't do those because you're active on Instagram and you're selling the Instagram and on your website, but you can't have those face-to-face -face conversations with people who are taking your art home. So that to me seems kind of heartbreaking. What can you say about that? I, I totally missed that this past year. I, there are things about the shows that I do not miss. Uh, being yeah. outside in a bad weather um, right. and really, almost every show had some instance of bad weather. Oh, or of course, because they're usually a few days or a week or a weekend or whatever. So, so yeah. I just missed that. Um, I've had one or two tents destroyed. Oh, and, no. Uh, some terrifying moments at the shows, but uh, it's the talking to people that, that makes it all worthwhile and connecting to people who come back and see you maybe several times um, a year or at least um, at the same show year after year. Yeah. And remembering yeah. those people and- uh, Yeah, it's making collectors. the community, the community aspect of it. So um, I'm sort of starting with one of my latest ones. Uh, and I, I couldn't have created a piece like this when I first started pulp painting. So this was something that I've I'm sort of showing you the um, where I'm at right now in terms of yeah. what I can do with pulp painting, but. Okay, so these are entirely pulp painting or do you layer on top with drawing? No, these are um, entirely pulp painting. Um, that's been my, sort of my practice up until this point is to see how much detail and how far I can get with the oh pulp. So I've never put anything onto my pulp paintings once they're once the sheets are dry. I am so stunned because there is such delicate detail in these. Um, and I wish we could zoom in on the wings, especially because of the white that is the detail in the wing, especially on the little bird on the bottom. Um, unfortunately, we can't zoom in. So can you walk us through the process? Yeah, so these are um, created with uh, stencils made out of uh, thin uh, polyester sheets. And I hand cut everything with uh, an alpha blade. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten pretty good at doing really, really small cuts for like the details on the wings. And a lot of times um, with, uh, with the pulp, one of the things that's really frustrating, but I also love about paper making is I'll go in and one day the white pulp will be behave completely different than it was when I worked with it the week before. Right. Um, and I have to add more retention aid or start over with new pulp. Right. Right. So it's always um, something unexpected that happens in the studio, which is really great. And you sort of go with the flow and um, figure out what's working that day. Like literally a flow because it's paperful. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, take us through the next slides. Oh, and it says at the top, I'm sorry, um, flax pulp painting, and you've got uh, the inclusions in there. And can you talk about how you decide what 
your paper base is? Sure. So, so far, um, most of the time lately, like in the past couple of years, I've just been experimenting with cooking down different types of fiber. And some of these mm -hmm. are given to me by people um, that things they grow in their yards. Like um, yeah. I used horsetail. Uh, Andrea Peterson just gave me some uh, corn, which I have not cooked down yet, but I will. Nice. And so a lot of it is just what I have on hand and what I'm experimenting with um, at the moment. And I like to blend fibers together. So especially if I'm working with um, a new fiber that's maybe a darker fiber, I'll add abaca or cotton to it to lighten it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's whatever I have on hand. And then as far as inclusions, I, I'll be adding thread, um, scraps of paper that I have laying around, um, mm -hmm metallic foil that's been yeah made. so the um the the base like this one says kozo hasta and cotton did you beat those together in the wonderful lovely Maryland's Ford beater or did you uh like beat a bunch of cotton and then you had some hasta that you threw in or hand beaten kozo and you mixed them together before you made it are they all beaten together so they're really incorporated they're um they're combined in the vat so I beat them separately. The kozo in this case would have been hand beaten uh, with a mallet. And then I would do the hasta and the cotton in the in the beater. Oh my goodness. Great. Um, yeah, just showing some examples of the birds. And then in this case, um, a lot of my birds now, how I got into doing birds is I got invited to do an Autobahn art show up in Wisconsin. And I had done no birds up to that point. So I don't know how I got into the show, but I did. Um, <laughs> and so I started a series of birds and they connected well with, uh, with the audience. So I've just continued them. And now people are always giving me um, recommendations for what birds I should do. So that's usually- Yeah, I, I love it. that. Cause it's the variety and the color. Do you have photographs of birds or do you have like a book that you pull the images from? I work from photographs um, uh, of other people, and sometimes they're people that I know. Um, doing the art fairs, you you start knowing a lot of the artists and photographers. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the the newest one I'm working on, which is a warbler, I'm actually uh, working from a, an image of a. Um, uh, sort of a, a scientific specimen of the bird. And I just like the, the posture and the detail in that specimen. But what I do normally is I'm taking several photographs that I'm referring to. And I might like the way the details of the wing are in one, but then I'll sure. change the, the, the feet and the way it's attached to the branch from another photograph. And I'm just creating my own collage sure. image that way. Yeah, and are these these are one of a kind? I would assume, or are they multiples. So, are you yes. able to do them as multiples since you're using stencils? Exactly. So, um, everything that I do with the pole painting is a multiple of at least two. Yeah. And what I love about that is, especially if they're custom pieces, I can show my client at least two pieces that they can choose from. And yeah. I intentionally do them a little bit different, but even if I tried to do them the same, they would turn out different, obviously. Of course, because it's the nature of the material. Yeah, so that's yeah. great. And um, both of these birds, the wren and the flicker were uh, custom pieces based on recommendations from clients. And where is your studio? Is it in your house? It is. So I moved to Bridgeport about three years ago, specifically so that I would have studio space. And so um, the first floor of my uh, townhome, we customized so that it has um, a floor drain and an overhead hose nice. and um, uh, a tiled floor. So I have the things that I need in there to be able to make my pieces. I love that. And this is a flying fox. 
box. Now, this was one that I was really struck by because you're saying it's eucalyptus. Tell us more about that. Was that just something that you got like at Trader Joe's and cooked down? <laughs> and did it smell while you were making the paper? Yes. Yeah, so um, this was a, a piece. I had done a series of bats. And um, one day at a show, a bat researcher who was researching these um, fruit bats in Australia she decided she wanted a custom piece. Um, so this is based on her photograph she sent me. And she let me know that they feed on the eucalyptus. So I Ooh. thought it would be great if I would, could somehow figure out a way to incorporate it. So I ordered off of Amazon um, some raw uh, eucalyptus or one that that wasn't processed in any way didn't have any chemicals added to it yeah yeah and i i cooked it down um this was the the smelliest fiber that i've done so far to cook um <laughs> yeah <sighs> because of all the oils that are naturally in the plant but um yeah. it worked you know it was hard to get this one to to beat down the way i needed it to so you could see all of the chunks um, yeah, I think even in this photograph, but it added uh, a lot of texture to the paper. So I was, I was pleased with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. And then oh, um, I have a, my other um, subject matter series is my architecture series. Um, and what I love about the architecture, this one falling water, um, Frank Lloyd Wright's building combines sort of the nature with the architecture. But most of my other ones are mostly focused on the architecture. And I love the contrast of trying to represent steel, concrete, and glass in, in handmade paper. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's a challenge, but I, I like the uh, sort of the disparity that happens because I always get sort of a not quite precise edge to my pieces and they become sort of blurred, sort of mm. nostalgic in a way. Um, yeah. Sort of photo, like look like an old black and white photograph sometimes. Yeah, I love that. This is oh, Mies van der Rohe's house, Farnsworth House uh, mm -hmm. in Grenoble, Illinois, the first glass house. Mm. These are great. What size are these? So most of my large pieces are two by three feet, which is the size of my uh, deco box. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. This is um, a building on North Michigan Avenue. It's the Medina Athletic Club, which is the Intercontinental Hotel. And oh, okay. this one, I, I had heard a story or read a story about it being built with a dirigible mounting spire on top. So ah. nothing ever mounted to it, but I imagine the scene of the dirigible suspended over the building. Yeah, and I love in this one, the dimension that you have with the foreground, middle ground, background that you've created with the different tones of the pulp. I love that. It's It adds more, because the other, the bird ones are kind of one, like here's the image of the bird they're three-dimensional looking, but they're they're flat on the page, and this one adds depth. I really enjoy this. And then um, I started with a Cleveland steel yard. So I'm from the Cleveland area, and I grew up um, when the mills were still in operation, and my relatives had worked in the mills. So I did a scene of the Cleveland steel yards. And it really responded um, or resonated with people strongly. And so I continued the series. So this one on the left is um, from an old photograph of the Pittsburgh Mills. Mm -hmm. And then the Ordoc, someone I recommended to me, I had not um, seen them before, but there are places on the Great Lakes where the ore would be loaded onto ships. And mm -hmm. This one is abandoned and it's up in Michigan. Um, so I just love the image and how it sort of seemed like a temple or a shrine. And yeah. so that, just that piece ended up looking like. Yeah. So what kind of dyes do you prefer? Because this blue is rather vivid. 
I use um, mineral pigments. Oh, okay. And I've gotten them from Twin Rocker. Yeah. But yeah. I, I just took a class with Radha Pandey on indigo dyeing. So it was the first time I was working with indigo dye. And I now I have two vats of indigo dye in my studio, which I'll continue to use. And that creates a different um, type of blue. Yeah, of course. Oh. So I've done two or three ships. Um, also Great Lakes ships. This one, um, again, the storytelling is so much a part of it. And someone had uh, told me about the Tashmu, which was a ship um, that went out of Detroit. And it ended up sinking in port during a party with a group of Shriners on board. Oh, wow. Rather than, they knew it was sinking, but they continued their party until the <laughs> ship struck bottom and then they just all got off. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I, I love the story behind it. So this, um, this sort of was inspired by that story. Yeah. And then just a couple miscellaneous pieces. I, because of my music background, I wanted to um, sort of try out some music subject matter. So I did a series of organ pipes, two so far, but I hope to continue the series. And then Krampus um, was, uh, the inspiration for this was Aaron Kramer did, was doing a Krampus show. Right, right. <laughs> I, had worked, I had worked with her um, on Art on Track and mm -hmm. she, she asked me if I'd be interested. So I did a series of four uh, pulp paintings based on Krampus. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah. And now to the books. Yeah, so my, my artist books, they're, um, they occupy a different part of my brain than the, than the paper making, and um, it's a nice balance. So with the books, and I, I continue to work with uh, Karen Hanmer, my good friend, and um, she's a strong mentor to me with the book making, and there's a lot of preciseness, measuring yeah. um, to creating these book structures, uh, which occupies one side of my brain, as opposed to the just letting it happen in the paper studio. I just, one day I might focus on my artist books um, and I have that repetitive thing that's happening with the sewing or with the measuring or the cutting or the folding. And yeah. um, I'll alternate that with a day of paper making where nothing's going the way that I wanted, and I just have to <laughs> let the pulp control me um, on the right. What's happening in the studio? That sounds like a lovely life, right there. <laughs> so this is oh, um, yeah. this is my latest artist book, which is a flag book structure, and it's based on the writings of Eddie Hillisum, who died in the Holocaust. She was a Dutch writer. So I incorporated her writings, um, excerpts of her writings, and they really, what you get in Eddie's writings are an embracing of the human spirit. And she saw light and beauty everywhere she looked, even in the camps. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to bring light into this book. And so I did it by um, having these uh, geometric shapes cut into these pieces. I used um, a laser cutter service. Yeah. And, uh, the book sort of flickers with light as you open it. And so this sort of geometric um, op artifact is inspired by the paintings of Julian Stanchek, who was one of the pioneers in the op art movement of like the 1960s, 70s. And yeah. um, his paintings inspired the visual design of this book. Yeah. How many are in this edition? There are five. Oh, that's so great. And then this mm -hmm. is one of my earlier books, um, which I actually started while I was still, I believe I was still at the Center for Book and Paper. Um, Charlie, forgive me. And this one also inspired by a story in Cleveland 
that happened in the late 1800s um, where it, it was a domestic um, murder that happened and the woman was shot and it became a sensational trial where the, the murderer was really given all the attention. And yeah. we ended up knowing a lot about him, but almost nothing about her. So I wanted to use sort of an imaginative text to tell her story. And so mm -hmm. as you page through this wooden book, um, you get her thoughts and you get more and more of the bullet holes as you go through the book. And so oh, the, wow. last, the last page is a reconstruction of um, an actual newspaper uh, page that I, that I created with um, handmade paper, handset type, and a pole painting of the murderer sort of showing through in the back. Oh, wow. And again, I'm gonna ask how many in this edition? This uh, has four, there's four oh, in this edition. Yeah. And this has been, I would say my most popular artist book, Fanny and the Doll Corpse, because it's a Chicago story. So this is a tunnel book. Ooh. It, hand sewn and I learned this technique from Andrea Dejo. Uh -huh, and yay. It's um, based on Frances Glesner Lee's miniature crime scenes. So she was- uh, Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> she grew up on Prairie Avenue in Chicago, um, the daughter of an industrialist. And she created these uh, around 20 um, really amazing dollhouse crime scenes that are quite macabre and very detailed. So I imagined for my story what she was like as a 10 year old solving her first crime. So that's the story. Uh, I love this. And then in the tunnel book, are, it's one of the rooms in the Glesner house and all of the clues to the murder mystery are in that scene. So it's sort of you figure out what clues are in the scene. Yeah, that's really cool. Very cool. Um, this is a <laughs> another structure I learned with Karen Hanmer, um, the Girdle mm -hmm. Book, a medieval mm -hmm. structure. And so it's sort of my um, artist book take on the traditional structure of the Girdle Book. So all of these pages are from recycled books about animals. And I have letterpress printed throughout um, there's 12 lines of text from one of St. Francis's um, uh, writings and mm -hmm. they were letterpress printed at Sputnik. Um, so it's his uh, Salutation of the Virtues. That's the name of the writing. Oh, that's great. How many are in this edition? This is an edition of 10. Nice. And these take a long time to make. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, they're very uh, time intensive. So that's yeah. what we have for you. All right, that is awesome. And here's all your contact info, your website, your Etsy, your Instagram, your Facebook, and your email. Um, thank you for showing us through all of those. That was great. So what next for you? What's the project that you're currently working on and what do you have in mind for your 2021? Sure. There's. Um, there's a couple things. One is I talked recently to Tom Balbo um, at the Morgan Conservatory in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And um, he was encouraging me to apply for a residency there. So I have a thought for that, which I had, I've started um, what I call my crow divination series. And they're images of crows that are paired with Viking rune watermarks. Oh. So there's there's 24 runes and each of my images, I put the crow in a posture to sort of imply the meaning of the rune. And I've done 13 of the 24 so far. Well, I'd love to finish this series and then bind them all into um, an edition of books. So that as you page through the, the, the book, you would get all 24 images of the crows with the runes and then the light would show through for the watermark as you page through it. Oh, wow. So that's that my idea. And um, I'm trying to figure out 
if I can complete this um, in a, like a two-week residency, which right. I think I can. But you probably could. So how big would be the addition? I'm hoping that it would be an addition of eight because eight is one of the the numbers that were um, important numbers to the Vikings. Yeah. And I've done my um, eight and three were the important uh, numbers for them, like their magic numbers. And so my addition of the single pieces I've done so far have all been additions of 24, so the eight times three. So I think that um, using eight as an addition number for this, this book, it's still, a lot of, it's still a lot of pieces of handmade paper, but the pulp painting itself is pretty simple. They're like only two or three stencils a piece. Yeah, yeah. So then how do you envision binding it? Or is that something you would work on in the next few months before the residency? Figuring right, out the, because they'll be flat sheets, right? Yes, so they would be, um, I'm thinking that they would probably, it would probably be a sewn edition, um, uh, maybe like a, a flat back case binding or something like that, but I'd have to work it out. Yeah, you'd have to figure out how you can make signatures out of those flat sheets. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it and I'm fingers crossed that that's what you end up working on and you end up finishing during that time. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing is, um, so writing has always played a, a part in my life and in uh, a lot of my artist books. So during um, this past year, I took a couple um, classes, online classes um, on Lit Reactor with uh, Francesca Lea Block, who's one of my favorite authors. Nice. And um, I've been working on a story on, it's sort of a modern retelling of uh, the fairy tale Iron John. Oh. And so I have the story written and uh, thinking about how to get that story published and possibly, I'm working with a, an illustrator now, a, a young artist, um, to possibly do illustrations and the cover design for that book. But um, figuring all that out, that's my other project. Oh, that's so exciting. That feels like a lot for 2021. It feels like the right amount. I don't know, it's kind of an odd thing. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was great. I've been um, so happy uh, watching the past year's foreign tours and uh, so happy to be a part of it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.